Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, uh, and thanks for a lot for, for to the organizers for, for inviting me to, to, to you know, provide this talk for you. Uh, so um, let me start with a few words. We agreed with, with Marek that uh, I'll start with a few words of, uh, let's say, introduction about myself. Uh, so I, uh, I'm a full professor at the Institute of Computing Science in uh, Poznan University of Technology. Poznan is a city midway between Warsaw and Berlin like five hour by train from here. And uh, I've been doing <laughs> primarily program synthesis and computer vision for about no, almost unfortunately 30 years, no, time flies. And that applies mostly to heuristic methods, former approaches and program synthesis. When it comes to computer vision, I'm mostly dealing with uh, image analysis uh, in medical applications. And actually those two threads can be combined somehow and there will be at least one slide that somehow indeed uh, refers or joins those two threads. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's it, I guess. Uh, you know, I, I, I was about to joke that, you know, you know, I've been advertised as the last speaker of the, of the event. Actually, I'm not, I'm not the last one, it seems, yeah, but I was about to say that, you know, perhaps I'm the last, but not the least one, hopefully. Uh, when it comes to the lecture outline, uh, I need to explain, essentially, uh, why actually this title, right? Why? Uh, machine learning meets program synthesis. Uh, there's actually a quite solid reason for that, because in a sense we will operate in both directions. So my intent is to, uh, after some very brief introduction into fundamentals of program synthesis, is to first talk to you about the ways in which machine learning can improve program synthesis, make it more efficient, more effective. And in the, uh, the second part, I'll be talking about the actually something that might be happening in the other way around, namely, how can we actually use program synthesis and machine learning? And in a sense, that's even more exciting, at least to for me. And in a sense, we'll be talking about program synthesis as a form of machine learning. Yeah, so uh, that's much when it comes to the introductions or, or the agenda. Uh, let me now mention a few caveats uh, as always yeah so because of the limited time you know one 90 minutes uh, i cannot promise you a comprehensive review of everything that is happens in this area even though you know it's not particularly densely populated by scientists um also there's no widely accepted curriculum on you know concerning that verge or that borderline between mach machine learning and program synthesis so actually it's very hard to organize the material in a comprehensible manner I, that's my take on it. You may agree with it or not. Uh, so actually in the process, I will be mostly discussing uh, selected representatives uh, that I find very you know, prominent or important or, or you know, uh, attractive in some sense. And every time I will be talking about you know, introducing a new, new work, I will start with, with, a with a slide with green background. Uh, so this perspective will be biases, biased by my preference, frankly. And because of the limited time, please forgive me if I will be cutting, you know, we are under pressure of, you know, of this, this limited time and I'll be cutting some, some you know, in-depth considerations or not, yeah, which perhaps will be even scarier if I delve into something and please stop me then, right? Okay, so after th those intros, let me start with a brief uh, take on program synthesis, how can we can broadly understand it in the current setting. You know, when we talk about program synthesis, we should start with first stating what is a program. And even that actually already might be quite, uh, no, not always leading to an agreement between uh, the dis uh, when we discuss that. So there are definitely multiple mutually non-exclusive interpretations of that term. Uh, quite often, and I think this is, a, this, is this is the most common perspective adopted in program synthesis, by program we understand uh, an abstract syntax tree of a program. Namely, I would say the quite fundamental, uh, the, you know, uh, basic, minimal representation of the program that can be still uh, executed. Yeah? Uh, occasionally, we by program we mean a source code with all the you know stop signs, tabs, you know, white spaces, and so on and so forth. But you know, from the viewpoint of the AST, they are typically decorators that are not not necessarily very important for uh, execution of the program. But perhaps it's also important to understand or realize that programs may be understood in a much broader sense. Yeah? 
That's why we quite often actually even refer to the term executable structure. So in a sense, any discrete, typically discrete, I would say, structure that can be in a some way executed or interpreted, like instruction by instruction or in some other sense, can be considered a program. Like, for instance, this uh, program is so-called Cartesian genetic programming, where uh, essentially the program is represented as a graph uh, that connects some inputs to outputs, and the graph actually expresses the dependencies between the intermediate states. Mm. Yeah, so... Uh, once we agreed you know, upon the broadly the definition of a program, the question is what do we understand by program synthesis? So a formal definition as, or as or the statement actually introduced by Mana and Waldinger in the 1980 is, uh, is the following. Given a programming language and a correctness predicate, find a program such that meets that correctness predicate. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so that we typically cite Mana and Moldiger, even though actually there were some earlier works that formulated this task in a very similar way. Typically, by this correct predicate, we understand some conformance with some specification. That specification may be formal or informal. And the kind of formal specification would quite often use also the word contract. You know, there's a contract defined for a function, for a program that has to be met. And uh, that con we are looking for a program that indeed meets that specific uh, contract. Um, yeah, so because of that, in, in this purest form, program synthesis is a search problem, not an optimization problem. Mm -hmm. We only know that we found the solution when we found it. Yeah? This, uh, this uh, correctness predicate is essentially an oracle uh, that uh, doesn't provide any information about, for instance, partial problem programs, or actually cannot express anything like you know, like degree of correctness of a program. And that's one of the main challenges in program synthesis. Yeah. By the way, there's some possible confusion with the term of automatic programming, but I will probably skip it. This is not so essential at this point. And indeed, uh, uh, for instance, if we uh, stick to the idea of uh, program synthesis as a synthesis from formal, formal, uh, formal specifications, then that specification could be a logical formula that defines when program behavior is considered correct. And a very practical example actually expressed in the well-known syntax of the Cygus context, uh, uh, syntax, uh, uh, syntax guided program synthesis, a well-known contest that is being run every year where people submit algorithms for program synthesis. Uh, in the language uh, based on Lisp, which is adopted in the community that runs that, consta uh, that, that contest, the uh, uh, specification of the program to synthesize the max function would look like this. We would have two constraints that express what should be the relationship between the output of the program and the, output, uh, and the input of the program, uh, you know, so that the program as a, as, a, as a whole is correct. And indeed, you know, we have algorithms, we have exact synthesizers that given this kind of specification expressed as a set of uh, logical formulas produce programs that are correct. By the way, this can be, for instance, solved by rephrasing the problem using uh, SAT solvers and satisfiability modular the theory solvers, given certain theories, yeah, meaning that there's, there's a certain theory that has to be loaded into the solver, like the, th the theory of uh, Boolean expressions, and um, based on that, uh, the, uh, th this, this, this program can be synthesized actually by, actually by, by posing the problem of, of finding actually counterexamples, finding you know, uh, inputs to the program that invalidate uh, these, these constraints. I will be coming back to that, uh, to that later. Yeah, but this was actually only one example in which we can approach the task of program synthesis. Uh, the problem with uh, you know, program synthesis that is a, that's a, you know, the, the domain itself is really huge now. Uh, why? Because it's like spanning multiple dimensions. Uh, there's a very nice uh, paper by Gulbani from you know, 2010 uh, called, uh, entitled uh, Dimensions in Program Synthesis, which very nicely organizes the entire topic. And he defines a few dimensions there, and actually the main dimensions he's talking about there is, is the user input, search space, and search technique. And the items I'm listing here in these bullets are actually the headings of the sections of that paper, 
and you can see that you know the user intent could be logical specification, like, like in the previous example, but also natural language. Input out of examples, actually th 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 there will be a few papers that will be covering here in this talk that actually use this kind of specification, but even program tra tra traces or partial programs, or programs that are similar to the one that should be synthesized. So actually there are many ways in which we can phrase or express the user intent, depending on the use case, so to say. Then we can define the search space in different ways, and uh, there are we can use different types of search techniques or search algorithms to actually organize the search space and conduct the search. And frankly speaking, this talk will be mostly about this third uh, point, uh, this last point in all of the slide. And you know, uh, in this next slide, I actually I'm trying to somehow even rephrase it or actually point to the fact that all that, you know, all those uh, combinations of these possible definitions or aspects actually lead to the you know, combinatorial explosion of the possible ways in which we can practice program synthesis, but there's always that, you know, uh, that, that chain of first the user, then the intent, then the source, the, the source code or the program. Uh, but please notice that uh, what Gulwani wasn't even actually mentioning, there is a kind of user, meaning it could be a programmer and system analyst, end user. The intent can be formal and informal. Uh, and actually also what Gulwani is not, I think, explicitly mentioning is also the aspect of scope, yeah, meaning Occasionally, what we want to synthesize is just a small code snippet, but it could be actually a large program, large function, or perhaps an object definition or something else. So in this way, I'm trying to, in a sense, excuse myself, you know, uh, meaning I'll somehow paint for you the picture that, you know, the, the topic is vast, really, and there are many ways in which it can be approached. And because of that, uh, of course, this kind of lecture needs to be, you know, selective. Okay, uh, so uh, again, in a nutshell, the key approaches, the key avenues in which the problem of program synthesis can be approached can be briefly summarized with this slide. So we can uh, search for the correct program by just enumeration yeah, uh, in a sum order, searching actually through the space of all possible programs, perhaps guided by the grammar given for the domain-specific language, until we find the correct program. In, in the sense of a given specification, but it could be a deductive search or inductive search. I will go now into, in, into details here. Um, uh, we can actually, and this is a very common approach, pose this task as a task of constraint solving, yeah? where, uh, as we have seen in this previous example, we uh, express the, uh, the contract as a set of constraints and we try to find the program that meets them. Uh, and there are also randomized approaches and heuristics like genetic algorithms or machine learning based algorithms and actually this talk will be mostly about them because as do will turn out those exact algorithms in most cases cannot scale because they uh, have to face the fact that actually program synthesis is, is NP uh, complete. Okay, so after this very brief intro, sorry for brevity, but uh, this is necessary, but uh, I, I think I will somehow uh, you know, uh, compensate for that in the next few minutes. Uh, let me move now to this first part, the proper part of this lecture, which will talk about the, uh, you know, how we can use machine learning algorithms or techniques to make program synthesis more, more efficient. Uh, the, the first question, question is why? Mm? And the, so, so what is the motivation for doing that, you know? And actually, the major motivation is that uh, program synthesis is a challenging combinatorial task. It's NP-complete. And uh, exact algorithms, that like that one proposed in that early MANA and Waldingen paper and many others, actually cannot scale. They, they, they enable us, actually, to synthesize programs uh, of the length, like you know, 20 instructions, perhaps 30. Yeah? Um, on the other hand, uh, there have been quite many heuristic algorithms designed in the meantime, so to say, since 1980s. For instance, one of the avenues that I've been engaged into was the genetic programming using evolutionary computation for program synthesis, and I will be referring to that a bit later. Uh, uh, but even those algorithms actually do not also, are, are not good enough in, the same in, the s in terms of success rate, meaning they, uh, they cannot, uh, okay, they occasionally help us synthesize programs effectively and efficiently. Uh, but this is difficult because the search space of programs is, so to say, very rugged, meaning uh, you know, it's very hard to, to design search operators 
and for that space that would operate in a predictable manner. And you, you know that actually from your own experience, right? When you write, write code and you modify a tiny bit in your function, the behavior of your function changes completely, right? And on the other hand, you can have two programs that look completely different, yeah? but they actually, the semantically speaking, do exactly the same thing, and you can perha perhaps even prove that. Yeah? So there's uh, many-to-many -many correspondence between programs and semantic behavior of programs, so to say. It's uh, one of the main challenges because it's not only many-to-many, -many, but also very, uh, very ragged or very, you know, very convoluted. Yeah? Then, of course, there are also some I would say practical uh, considerations or uh, you know motivations like uh, you know, especially recently we have a growing market for commercial applications of program synthesis, uh, particularly those based on uh, natural language, uh, and actually in, in different modes of operations like hinting, code completion, synthesis of functions, and more. And quite importantly, and that will be very important and I think quite uh, perhaps novel for many for of you, hopefully aspect is the fact that there are actually large volumes of data available, which is very important, of course, for contemporary machine learning methods, which are often data hungry. Um, and actually, that because there are, there are two types of sources of data, one of them is obvious, meaning that, and you most, most likely you've heard about that, right, that we have, of course, huge repositories of human produced code and you know, GitHub and other resources, right? And that code can be actually pretty good. It's often curated, annotated, commented, and so on. Uh, and that's one source of data that is being used particularly for when we use uh, large language models for program synthesis. But actually, I would like to point you to the other aspect, namely that essentially every program is a potentially data generator mm -hmm. uh, or problem generator, meaning that if you have a program, even a random program, but a syntactically correct program, uh, so a program P, let's say, uh, you can take that program and uh, using, for instance, static analysis or some symbolic execution, you can derive the contract, the formal contract of that program. So, and then given that, you, what you get is essentially a training example of the form contract and program. Yeah? Uh, and it's a synthetic example, right? But it actually nicely maps the contract to a program. Yeah? And it can be used as a training example of your system, which is supposed to synthesize programs from contracts. Yeah. yeah. Could you uh, elaborate more on, on what exactly the contract is? Is it like an interface or, uh, I don't know, an informal description of what the program in does? Mo in most cases, yeah, thank you for this question, very good question. Uh, in most cases, that would be actually very uh, formal, uh, well, actually formal contract, for instance, uh, uh, an invariant. As you may know, or some of you may know that we have tools like Lint or other static analyzers and other tools that actually allow us to, given uh, a written program, a synthetically correct program, say something about the state of the program execution at different points. For instance, at the end of the execution, but not only there. And uh, you can ask such an analyzer to, for instance, induce an invariant at a given point of execution. And that uh, invariant already constrains the, all the number of all possible states your program can be uh, can arrive at a given point of execution, and this could be a partial contract, for instance. Yeah, of course, it will all depend on the sophistication of that engine you are using for generating contracts. So that's yeah. yeah. Uh, I have like one more question. Uh, could you go back to the previous slide and sure. uh, elaborate more on this? Uh, non-differentiability of the objective function, because I'm not like 100% sure why. Yeah, uh, that's a, again very good question, but I will have a more detailed slide later about that. So cool. I'll elaborate. Uh, yeah, very good point indeed. Yeah. Okay. So coming back, if there are no more questions at the moment, then let me go back here to this point and say that the other scenario in which you can use a program, even as I said, a random program to synthesize a training example is you can actually apply that program uh, to some, again, perhaps randomly generated inputs or, or perhaps not randomly generated inputs and uh, run it on those pro inputs and produce outputs. So in this way, arriving at a, s of, or, uh, at a set of input-output pairs. And then, uh, as a result, then you obtain a training example of the form uh, set of tests or examples map to a program. Yeah? And this kind of examples can be uh, used for training machine learning models 
either generative or non-generative, I will talk about that, uh, that synthesize or generate programs from uh, sets of input output with examples, or in other words, tests. Mm -hmm. And that actually, that characteristics that, in a sense, inherently generative aspect of program of programs is being exploited by some of the contemporary uh, methods of program synthesis, and I will talk about that too. Okay, uh, so now uh, how can actually more, more direct, or trying to somehow you know organize this part of my talk when it comes to those methods that improve program synthesis using machine learning, then uh, there are two avenues I think that are which are quite distinct. One of them involves indirect uh, use of machine learning models, uh, namely using them to just prioritize the search in program space. And this will be the next part, or subpart, part 1A. But in, in the more ambitious scenario, uh, we will be talking about using machine learning models to generate, actually, programs directly from some specification. And uh, in that case, you can say, you can talk about indirect approaches or generative approaches. So let me start with those indirect approaches, because in the sense they are, they are most uh, no, no simpler and also uh, easier, I think, easier to track. Uh, so idea here, the idea is here that we um, just use machine learning for a broadly speaking search prioritization. And you might have heard about that, namely we have many combinatorial and non-combinatorial optimization problems where people have been designing uh, heuristic search algorithms for ages using some you know, uh, domain knowledge to uh, guide the search pro problem, of course, mostly for tasks that are NP, uh, NP complete. And uh, it turns out, has been observed for like perhaps uh, two decades, I would say, that it is possible to use machine learning to detect certain biases in the search process and actually try to uh, use those biases to guide the search process in the right direction, uh, on another or in other words, prioritize the search process. And this mostly applies to iterative search algorithms. And uh, especially when we, we talk about heuristics and uh, meta heuristics, mo most of them are iterative, right? We start with some initial state of the uh, search process, for instance, a subset of uh, the search tree or graph nodes, and then we decide which of the nodes ex to expand and how. And of course, you know, the depth first search, breadth first search are, you know, specific cases of this uh, you know, blueprint, right? But now the question is, can we do that better, right? Can we, starting from some original or initial, initial stage, uh, search state, search that space in a way which is more efficient because uh, in the sense that we have a greater chance of arriving at the correct program earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so the whole idea in this scenario is that we use the mach trained machine learning to make those choices. Yeah? And there are actually many advantages of this approach because it has this sort of clean inter interface uh, between the method and the prioritization module, right? So in, in many cases, actually, you can take an existing search algorithms or, or you know, solver for some domain, and you can plug in a machine learning module there so that that, that but module takes over the, 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 you know, the or it becomes responsible for making those choices about which states to expand and in which direction guide the search process. And yeah, and the uh, specific uh, you know, example, actually very neat um, case I would like to cover in this uh, next few slides is the deep coder, which actually follows exactly this scenario and is a very nice example of uh, you know, machine learning used for prioritization uh, in program synthesis. Uh, so uh, the team of these authors actually came up with the following idea, which actually, when I saw that paper, I, I couldn't believe that that, that that could work, right? That was that th th these were still like, long, I would say, early days of, relatively early days of deep learning. And uh, because actually the model they used there uh, wasn't actually even particularly sophisticated and is definitely not deep by today's standards. Uh, the model is a relatively simple uh, multi-layer perceptron, which is trained on examples which are pairs of data sets or sets of tests, as in the example I've been showing a few slides before. And those input-output pairs are being fed into the model. And what the model is supposed to, uh, to produce in response to that is the 
distribution of, okay, actually the set of vector of probabilities expressing how likely it is that a given instruction from the instruction shell set of this particular DSL, of that particular language, should occur in this particular, well, given these particular input-output pairs. Mm -hmm. So, b you know, in other words, if you do not have this kind of prioritization, this distribution, actually, this, this vector is, should contain all ones, yeah? meaning that you, you don't know anything, so the use of any instruction in your program is uh, equally likely. Mm -hmm. But it turns out you can effectively train a neural network on this kind of uh, input, uh, or on this kind of examples, and make this kind of, pred uh, this kind of predictions. <laughs> and uh, the authors of this particular paper, uh, they, again, they benefited also from this, as I said, this very nice clean interfacing between this idea yeah, the pr of prioritization and the search algorithms themselves. So they were not actually using just a single search algorithm or synthesis algorithm, they actually used four different uh, search algorithms. Uh, first of all, they used quite rudimentary depth-first search, where uh, that, that search was working with all functions at once, so it was actually iteratively constructing program by program, starting from the starting symbol of the grammar, yeah, and actually iterating uh, the trees of uh, the AST tree of the, uh, the, the notes, sorry, of the uh, AST tree of the program. Uh, but uh, when prioritized, that uh, expansion would happen in the order determined by the predicted probabilities. Yeah? So according to those probabilities predicted by the model, given the input-output examples. Then they had actually a more sophisticated variant, which wasn't actually working with the entire instruction set at once. Actually, it was working with a subset of active functions. Yeah? So there was a small subset of active functions at the beginning. By functions, I mean here these you know, essentially instructions of the language. Yeah? Uh, and only when the search with a limited subset of functions would fail, that set would be expanded with another function in the order given by the probabilities, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Yeah? And also they actually used two essentially state-of-the-art synthesizers, one of them based on the concept of program sketching by Armando Solar Lazama, a big figure in the program synthesis community who came up with the idea of uh, program synthesis based on sketches, where the user actually only formulates a partial program with holes, meaning like missing, missing parts, and the synthesizer is supposed actually to fill in those gaps. And here also you can use this kind of prioritization. And they also used yet another algorithm, lambda, lambda squared, which I will not talk about for brevity. Most importantly, yeah, sorry. Lambda, I think, isn't in the scope, but uh, th does it mean that it's uh, th the model is generating lambda formula, or does it, does it no, have no, anything it's with it? To to my to my knowledge, no. That's actually an uh, even older algorithm that was, you know, I would say, uh, an algorithm that in engaged both uh, deductive uh, search and also enumerative search from program synthesis. And actually, to my knowledge, it doesn't involve lambda lambda expressions, if, if that's what you meant, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know any models that involve lambda expression, actually? Uh, yeah, actually, in one of the studies I will be covering closer to the end of the my lecture, that there's actually one uh, very nice example of Great. a system. Thank you. Good. Yeah, so, uh, but most importantly, uh, this indeed worked, meaning uh, the authors were able to show that by using this kind of prioritization, they can uh, substantially speed up the, the, the program synthesis multiple times, uh, the impact of this prioritization was different for different types of algorithms, as you can see here, uh, but uh, this, uh, you know, this worked. Moreover, actually, uh, quite importantly, the baseline they've been using here to measure the speed up wasn't just you know, the assumption that the probabilities of all instructions are the same. That would be very naive, and those baselines would be even higher. So actually, what they used as a baseline uh, so to say, a priori probabilities of instructions occurring in programs. So they, they actually took the training set and they calculated the probability of every instruction, every function of in the language occurring in those programs. And that, you know, vector of probabilities was used as the, you know, uh, um, as this uh, vector for, for this uh, basic approach. Uh, uh, most importantly, I'm, I'm not calling this probability distribution, of course, because as you may see, of course, they, these numbers do not sum up to, to one. 
Okay, so very neat example and a very highly cited paper, uh, which actually somehow you know in invited us, uh, my colleagues and me, to come up with a, so to say evolutionary variant of this approach uh, and actually exploit this essentially very similar principle in uh, program synthesis guided by evolutionary algorithm. Uh, so what we did, uh, you know, a few years ago, uh, we in a sense, hybridize this kind of philosophy with genetic, with genetic programming. I've heard from Marek that uh, you had some, you know, uh, mentions of program synthesis in the previous lectures and symbolic regression as well. Perhaps somebody mentioned that symbolic regression can be solved using genetic programming, and this is actually one of the you know, popular techniques for solving uh, symbolic regression problems. Uh, but uh, Overall, genetic programming can be used not only for symbolic regression, but actually also for program synthesis. And uh, in brief, genetic programming is, is simply an uh, evolutionary algorithm applied to a population of programs. Programs typically represented as abstract syntax tree like these ones, you know, for actually these are relatively simple because they just capture some expressions without conditional statements or loops, but you can do that as well. And, uh, you know, the uh, search started with a population of random programs, which is somehow initialized, typically some, some uh, random uh, operators. And then, based on the fitness function or the, you know, the quality of candidate programs that are being selected using some selection operators that you may have heard of, like tournament selection or other, which are typically used in evolutionary computation, you select uh, some parent solutions and you create offspring solutions from them using different search operators like mutation, which for instance can uh, uh, pick a randomly uh, pick a random node in the AST tree and replace it with another random subtree, or crossover, which will take two randomly actually two selected solutions, pick nodes in those solutions and swap the sub-expressions. Of course. If the DSL in question was a typed programming language, then of course all those mo manipulations would have to obey the type system of this uh, of this uh, setting, so to say. And all this process, this iterative search process, is being driven uh, by a fitness function, which preferably should be, I would say, you know, like uh, granular or not binary, zero or one, right? Uh, and for instance, what is quite common is uh, applying this kind of uh, technique to synthesize programs from uh, specifications which I express as set of examples. And in such case, uh, the quality of a program as measured by the fitness function is the number of tests that the give a given program passes, yeah? or percentage of tests that a given program passes. Yeah, so uh, given genetic programming, we actually combine the idea uh, from the deep coder with uh, our approach. So we just uh, used uh, the same kind of uh, neural network to prioritize the search or, or to prioritize, priori prioritize sorry, the uh, operation of uh, evolutionary operators. Uh, so we've been first training this kind of network, very similarly to that uh, you know, in the original deep coder. And then we used the determined probabilities to guide the actions of or so choices of search operators. Um, so that was almost identical to what uh, the guys with DeepCoder did, and you know we, we had slightly different you know set of instructions, but other than that, it's almost uh, you know it's very similar. And this is, for instance, the table that summarizes the uh, probabilities produced by this trained neural network for a you know set of nine programs, uh, uh, and you know uh, in each row you have probabilities for different syntactic elements of the language, so to say, or functions, and also some terminals, or some you know, elementary um, arithmetic uh, operators, and so on. Uh, first of all, we definitely see that the you know, probabilities, probabilities are quite diversified. Uh, let's have a closer look at at least one or two examples. So here, uh, the task was to uh, synthesize a program that computes the sum of the smallest numbers from the list B. Uh, of a, sorry, a, sm a uh, uh, smallest numbers. Let me, let me, for instance, two smallest numbers from this list, uh, one smallest number from this list, and so on. And the program that indeed solves this problem in this particular domain-specific language that is being used in this you know, realm, so to say, looks like this. And uh, this is the this uh, uh, this row in this matrix 
shows the fragment of this matrix from the previous slide uh, for P0. And you can see that indeed those probabilities so somewhat, so to say, correlate with the content of the program. Namely, the neural network was indeed capable of correctly predicting that there's a high probability that this task, given you know, these input output examples, because that's the only thing that the neural network actually has seen, right? This is what it receives as input. So in response to that, it says, you know, there's a pretty high probability that this task requires the use of uh, instruction take. And indeed, that's the case, right? And also, there's very high probability or relatively high probability that this program or this task, if solved using our DSL, will require the use of the sum function. But of course, there are some you know, failures of the models. You can, for instance, see that we need a sorting right in this particular task, but the model actually wasn't particularly good at predicting the need of sorting in this, this particular setting. But you know, at least I would say that probability predicted by the model wasn't zero. Right? Yep. Question. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have a question about this approach or this kind of approaches. Do you have any knowledge about? I don't know, using the uh, uh, NLP's methods here, because I suppose that you could also, because right now you have like the, only the prior distribution, uh, or try to, to, to get the posterior distribution of specific, uh, specific parts being mm -hmm. uh, in the AST or somewhere else. And I can imagine that you could also include that, I will say, summarizing of this, of this uh, input of, uh, of text or something like that and get the uh, conditional posterior distribution there. Yeah, thank you. You are very good at anticipating what will come next, I would say, in the lecture. Meaning, uh, I'll be talking about uh, NLP-based models, actually, and indeed, yeah, synthesis from natural language is a big thing nowadays, as we keep hearing uh, everywhere. Uh, so, yes, indeed. Uh, and, uh, of course, in this particular formulation, this uh, you know, uh, linguistic task or linguistic formulation of the task is not the part, actually, of the official input to the, to the network. Yeah? But you are absolutely right that this is where we are uh, currently. I won't be talking much about that, frankly. I have some reservations about la large language models, yeah, but you know, <laughs> I will come back to that later. Okay, another example, so maybe very briefly, you can see that, again, quite apt prediction of the model. This time, the task is to compute the minimal total area of rectangles which are constructed by pairing dimensions given in list A and B, so just multiply, right, and, and, uh, and then uh, su uh, sum them. Uh, sorry, actually, no, it's, it's more sophisticated, it requires also sorting. So anyway, uh, you can see that the model was capable of predicting that zip width uh, is, in, is an important element uh, that is required to solve this task. Similarly for summation, oh, summation actually not that, that good. Yeah, uh, and again, definitely some false positive, namely the model actually uh, claimed that uh, the instruction sub one will be necessary here, while actually it doesn't seem to be necessary in this particular, you know, version of the program. Yes. Yeah, just a quick question. Could you uh, repeat how the, this network is trained so that what is its label? Because it's you have okay. program inputs and output, but yep. what are the labels? Yeah, so the, the input, the, the, program, the network is simply trained on explicitly, <coughs> sorry, these data. Yeah, these actually uh, uh, input output examples or tests which are being you know, appropriately encoded and fed into the model, into the network. And the expected output from the model is the vector of probabilities, each of them associated with one lexical element of the language. And that's it. And you know, uh, so okay, the- Okay, but you, like, uh, you have to have a data set, right? Yes. And the data set is like- uh, Exactly. So, yeah. So, the uh, technically, as you can see, that this is actually some. This is the you no, know, the diagram from the original paper uh, from DeepCoder. Uh, so, there's actually there's a repetitive element in the uh, neural network, which is uh, like I would say a head, which is like iterating over the input-output pairs. And but all these components are, um, uh, you know, uh, multi-layer perceptrons essentially. Uh, they watch, so to say, the input-output pairs, they embed them into some latent embeddings, and those embeddings are then uh, concatenated and fed into the final structure of the model that predicts the probabilities. 
very rudimentary model, right? I, if I recall correctly, they don't even, uh, the model themselves, the original deep coder uh, neural network couldn't even handle a varying number of input examples, yeah? but still was capable of uh, the, you know, predicting those uh, probabilities, as you can see, quite, quite nicely. Of course, not perfectly, yeah? uh, but the, the numbers speak for, for themselves, right, in the original deep coder paper. And actually also in our case, uh, this translated into, I will skip this slide because it's not so important, it, it actually it details how we actually implemented mutation and, cro and crossover in this particular DSL because it's non-trivial. As you can see, the programs are not represented as ASTs, they are actually represented as sequences of instructions. And when crossing over two programs, you need to take care whether the syntactic elements are are available, and namely, for instance, you know, for instance, the reverse D operation uh, makes sense only if you have a list of uh, available already from the, you know, produced by one of the earlier instructions. Yes, yeah? so that there are certain dependencies that need to be met. So this slide talks about them, but let me speak about this. Skip that. So uh, in brief, in our case, we actually were not so interested in uh, speeding up the search process, but more actually making the synthesis more effective, meaning uh, increasing the likelihood of uh, synthesizing the correct program, of finding the correct program. And without uh, going much into detail, we, we, we tested, you know, different, uh, we, we tested how this approach actually works in combination with different, uh, you know, um, uh, selection operators, uh, different uh, definitions of uh, search operators as well, but I, I think I will skip that. Uh, overall, the impact was very positive. Indeed, this kind of prioritization made the evolutionary search more efficient because the search operators were using or picking uh, the right or the right uh, uh, instructions or more probable instructions based on the predictions of the machine learning model. In particular, I think what I should emphasize is that. Uh, we are even able to show that this is uh, capable of sort of extrapolation. Namely, we've been uh, training our model on a set of small programs, and then we showed that uh, uh, it makes positive impact f when synthesizing longer programs. Yeah, so it's so it's not like just you know limited. Uh, the effect of this uh, prioritization is not limited to the. Uh, closed set of programs like gain length, but there's a certain degree of generalization in, in this sense. Okay, uh, so that's it. Um, now, uh, I would like to, to talk for a moment about you know slightly different uh, approach, uh, but uh, somehow combined with more sophisticated neural networks, uh, more, more specifically graph neural networks where uh, also the domain is slightly different because here we won't be talking for a moment about uh, program synthesis, you know, per se. We'll be talking about uh, theorem provers. Yeah? So in this particular study, again, very nice, uh, very, very recommended paper. I think I, I like it. I, I regularly lecture that in my, in my lectures or mention it. Um, so the idea here is to how to improve the efficiency of navigation in the vast space of proofs uh, when running uh, uh, theorem provers. Uh, more specifically, the authors here, uh, re you know, applied the approach to a, uh, I think, relatively well-known benchmark of uh, 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 proofs, which contains 20,000 mathematical theorems and their proofs. Uh, prepared already in a form that is digestible, so to say, for machine learning systems. And actually, to, to be honest, actually, the, the authors themselves were, I think, co-authors of that benchmark as well. Right? But based on that, actually, now uh, there are many other, uh, also uh, other uh, approaches that uh, appro use this, the, this, the same benchmark. Of course, you may ask, actually, what does theorem proving has in common, right, with uh, having common with program synthesis? Uh, so this is a s small interlude, in case you don't know, <laughs> because as many of you may know, that there's a very strong uh, you know, relationship or correspondence between logic and programs, uh, which is called Curry-Howard correspondence, uh, which says that typed functional languages are calculi for proof construction, uh, namely that the proof produces a construct with required properties of a certain type, mm. and they're also conversely, uh, proof construction has certain computational meaning. 
or trying to, in a sense, decompose this correspondence into two aspects. There is a correspondence, which is doesn't always have to be one-to-one, -one, but there's a you know, formal correspondence between propositions uh, in programming language, oh sorry, in, in logic, and function functions in programs, meant as, you know, uh, in a sense, elementary B building blocks in logic and uh, respectively in programs. And there's also an analogous uh, correspondence between inference rules used in logic and combinators in the functional programs. It's a very strong result, which in a sense justifies you know, the fact that, that it, may, it does make sense to you know, consider proof construction as a special form of program synthesis. So in this particular paper, the authors represented uh, the uh, axioms uh, uh, as uh, abstract syntax trees. Th originally, they used trees, yeah, uh, and uh, but the trees actually turned out to be quite verbose. And that's why actually th they turned to graphs. So what they did, they decided to find common sub-expressions in those trees and merge them, uh, turning those trees into graphs, which made the actual representation much, much smaller. And, uh, mm, and of course, you can still see that the you know, representation is quite verbose because, uh, actually, this is, for instance, how you express the application of a function to an argument in this particular, uh, in this particular formalism, right? So A stands for application, V stands for variable, fun stands for function, so this is the uh, type of a function from type A to type B, and this is essentially a declaration of the variable, functional variable, right? And this is declaration of the of the argument of that function, and A means application of a function to an, 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 an argument. Yeah? Uh, but most importantly, uh, uh, what the authors here used were graph neural networks, uh, which I guess some of you may be familiar with. Um, and uh, more specifically, they were because this is like four or five years ago, they've been using quite rudimentary by today's standards graph neural networks with quite regular, so to say, simple message passing, where in a nutshell, the uh, network can be imagined. And actually, I, for, for my credit yesterday, there was a whole you know, long you know, uh, two uh, lectures about you know, graph neural networks yesterday. So perhaps in terms of that lecture, this particular model is very primitive. You know, the, it's just, you know, in a essentially a multi-layer perceptron hanging over each node of the uh, of the graph yeah, to produce the embedding of a node, which somehow uh, captures the the essence of that particular node. And there, there's message passing or message formation stage in which the uh, multi-layer perceptron, which looks simultaneously at two nodes of the graphs that are connected with an edge and produce a message. That message, those messages are produced for each, for all actually edges in the graph, <coughs> and they are uh, aggregated typically using summation for a given node, you know, along, you know, for, for all the neighbors of a given node. So, uh, pardon me for being so brief here, but I hope that, you know, in the context of yesterday's lectures, that's, you know, uh, uh, enough, so to say. And also, this pro probably, again, <coughs> the details, the technical details are not so essential here, that what is probably important is the, the whole fact that this allowed them to be able to encode those variable size combinatorial structures, which are graphs, in an embedding, which is a, you know, a fixed length vector of you know, fixed dimensional embedding, which can be then pr you know, somehow processed by a neural network, and in response to that, uh, you know, provide for that prioritization that I mentioned before. More specifically, actually, the authors here used two uh, uh, GNNs, one for encoding the goals of the proof process, and the other one for encoding the premises of a, a given uh, proof. Uh, so these are the pure GNNs, meaning they actually do not change the uh, graph structure as, you know, the you know, the standard graph neural networks, they operate, you know, uh, on each node independently in a sense, and they produce an a final embedding again, which has the same structure as the input graph. Uh, then they were, uh, you know, after some uh, projection of the output uh, on a to the higher, dim higher dimension and max pooling. So actually the max pooling is the moment in which uh, the max pooling is applied over or across the entire network. So no matter, or sorry, the entire graph, 
So no matter how many nodes in your graph are, graphs are, you get a single vector of the same dimen dimensionality, and that vector is interpreted as goal embedding and premise embedding. And those two vectors are then fed into the final modules of this ML, so to say, component here in this approach, namely the tactic classifier and premise scorer. And the tactic, in brief, the tactics classifier, the, the whole idea here is that uh, in those proof, uh, theorem provers, quite often what we have are predefined tactics, you know, certain uh, ready to use uh, uh, recipes to proceed with proofs. And uh, so rather than actually coming up with completely novel tactics, these authors here uh, just you know, decided those models to point to those tactics. I think there were like 41 of them. So actually this tactic classifier is essentially a classifier or a, 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 a multi-layer perceptron which produces 41 outputs and each, each of them actually corresponds to one of those tactics. So this is how it points to the, or suggests use a given of a given tactic in a given step of the proof process. Uh, for premises, it's more con uh, convoluted, but still the premise is, you know, the uh, premise is the current, so to say, working input to the uh, search process. And the decision about premises uh, is meant to be used, you know, to decide in which direction in this huge space of uh, search, uh, of, pr of proof of space, the, s the system should be guided. Yeah. So there are probably too many d details, but you know, uh, as we agreed, uh, I will be making those PDFs available for you. So you know, then we can perhaps delve deeper into that. My goal is here to somehow give you a uh, glimpse of what the essence of those uh, approaches are. Uh, so again, uh, so um, uh, actually, an interesting fact is that this particular approach uh, em applied imitation learning, namely, what is also available in that uh, benchmark database are not only the proofs, but actually are those are a bit like a traces of proofs, namely they somehow exemplify how humans you know, uh, manually guide the proof process. You may know that you know, systems like this here, or for instance, Isabel, right, or Koch, right, which we may have heard, you know, th these are so-called proof assistants, yeah? They, they typically, they do not automate the proof process entirely for you because that, that's typically impossible or, you know, it doesn't scale. The whole idea is that they assist you, uh, they guide you or help you, you know, in the conduction of the proof process. And, uh, and because of that, there's that, you know, transcript in a sense of many manually conducted proofs uh, you know, alongside with the database of, uh, of uh, proofs. And the uh, neural network was trained here to actually imitate the behavior of a human guider, so to, uh, or the human expert, so to say. Um, yeah, uh, and that definitely worked. Namely, the authors were able to sh show that with this particular architecture, and in particular by using that graph neural network, they uh, uh, were able to substantially uh, speed up the, or actually not even speed up, but actually the increase the success rate of the proof completion process. Actually, or more specifically, putting that in the, you know, uh, the professional language here, how what is the percentage of so-called closed proofs? I mean, proofs that have been actually successfully uh, conducted uh, till the very end. There are some minor differences in different variants of the method, but overall, again. This is a very ni neat example of how uh, the process of uh, uh, the, the process of uh, of program synthesis or proof synthesis in this particular example um, uh, can be efficiently uh, aided with uh, machine learning. Yeah. Okay, just a brief mention that uh, with my PhD student we are currently working on also using graph neural networks, w but actually for the proper program synthesis. In brief, we are. Rather than working with AST trees, we are working or abstract syntax trees. We are working with abstract syntax graphs. Namely, we are generating abstract syntax graphs which actually embrace multiple abstract syntax trees at the same time, and we are using a graph neural network to prioritize the expansion of that graph uh, in the expectation that you know this network will guide us towards the uh, correct, so to say, completion of a given program, uh, given. Uh, task formulation. That's just a mention. This is work in progress. Uh, not published yet, but I hope that one day I will be able to to brag about that uh, a bit. Yeah. Okay. So uh, 
so as, as you may have noticed, you know, all those prioritizers so far were based on uh, uh, neural networks. Uh, and actually neural networks uh, trained either in supervised mode or in the imitation mode, which is essentially also supervised mode. Uh, the question is, uh, are there any others, you know, uh, machine learning paradigms or techniques being used for pr such prioritization in program synthesis? As a matter of fact, there are. And uh, there are a few, but there are not too many, frankly. Uh, but uh, for instance, there's a substantial number of papers which try to approach the same problem with uh, reinforcement learning, where one of the main advantages is that with reinforcement, reinforcement learning, you can address this one-to-many relationship between specifications and programs. Namely, um, for supervised learning, if you require your program, to your, your, synthesis, your synthesizer to produce a given program for some specification, then in a sense you constrain, you know, somehow limit uh, expressiveness because you require that particular synthesizer to produce this specific program for this specification. Yeah? While, as I mentioned in the beginning in the like of, the, of the lecture, there might be other programs that also solve the same task. Right? Uh, with reinforcement learning, you are free from this limitation, right? because you do not specify the target explicitly, and you just reward your system uh, for just arriving at the program that solves your task. So that's interesting. Unfortunately, it doesn't work too well, and that's, in my opinion, uh, one of the reasons uh, why there are not too many papers actually that follow that avenue. F somewhat, you know, reinforcement learning doesn't seem to scale in those settings, perhaps because they are very discrete. Again, those that objective funct function is very rugged and so on. But, you know, uh, there are also other ways in which actually we can sort of uh, prioritize uh, the search process in uh, the program synthesis. And at this point, I have a uh, a few slides about other approach that is cannot actually be easily qual qualified or somehow you know that doesn't subsume to what I said before. Uh, but given the limited time, I think I will skip it. Uh, let me just say that it's uh, you know an approach in which we are able to synthesize pr provably concre uh, correct programs from formal specifications um, using um, an approach which somehow somewhat hybridizes uh, genetic programming again with program synthesis. And just a, a few sentences about this approach, uh, because I think I, sh I should be moving on. Uh, namely, uh, we have a formal specification that defines um, the task. And uh, um, what we do, we uh, let the genetic programming algorithm produce candidate programs. Those programs are being tested on examples and if they are, uh, if they pass tests uh, or, or input output examples, they are subject to formal verification using an SMT solver. And the very important property of uh, SMT solvers that you may be aware of is that whenever an SMT or SAT solver fails to prove your formula, it will produce a counterexample. Yeah? an example of an assignment of variables that uh, cause this particular formula not to be true. And we use those counterexamples as, uh, as a way of expanding our set of input out of examples. And in this way, in a sense, in the iterative process, the search algorithm produces new input output example for itself, yeah? which is very valuable here, because at the beginning, the set of input out of examples ac actually is empty because this is the task of synthesis from formal specifications, so there are actually no examples here. There's only a contract which says your program is correct if its output meets this particular constraint. Yeah? Uh, so I'm mentioning that, of, you know, not to brag that we did that, but also to point to the fact that you may have heard or may, if you look into the richer literature around these topics, you will find this phrase counterexample driven quite often, yeah? where you use a solver, that solver you know, queries some is being queried on some candidate solutions, but in response to that, it produces uh, you know uh, counterexamples which can be explode, exploited for making your search process more efficient. But let me skip that overall because I don't think there there's enough time, even if I have some <laughs> no uh, leniency from from the organizers. But still, okay. Uh, so a summary. Um, 
uh, this indirect approach to program synthesis uh, aided with machine learning it has this advantage, as I said, that you know, there's very nice interfacing between uh, machine learning module and program synthesizer. Uh, and the very important advantage is that if it happens that the original algorithm that is being uh, you know, prioritized is exact, then it will be still exact. Meaning if, for instance, you, you have the guarantee, you know, a naively speaking even guarantee for, for the, let's say, breadth first search to finally arrive at the correct solution, right? Then uh, this program or this after this prioritization, this will be still true, right? Uh, so your, 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 your synthesizer will find the correct solution. Uh, so it's still exact in this sense, but it's quite likely to actually do it in a much faster, uh, much, much shorter time, and that's the main advantage. But there are some limitations. In particular, uh, one may argue uh, that um, these approaches do not exploit the full capabilities of machine learning models as we know them today, and that's one of the motivations for using those direct approaches which are not just limited to search prioritization, but actually they co go further, and they really attempt to use machine learning to generate candidate programs. Uh, yeah, uh, so, yeah, so that's actually, that's just said that, so probably no, no point in staying on that slide. So, and definitely, as uh, there was already a, a question from the audience, that uh, definitely one of the uh, poster ch child, uh, poster child of today's, so to say, state of the art in this realm is our large language models, which indeed allow us to synthesize programs from natural language. Many of them are based on the transformer blueprint, and uh, they are very nicely, mm, they cope very nicely with even with programming languages, or you know, programming languages used by everyone, not just domain-specific languages, and as you may know, many of them actually can uh, handle even multiple programming languages, which is very impressive. And in this, you know, th these few bullets I collected, a few examples of the names you, you've definitely heard, actually, these are like, you know, the GitHub Copilot, right, IntelliCode, Tabby, or Arial Tab9. And there's a very nice review, actually, of uh, program synthesis with large language models I can recommend to you, and you know, cited at the bottom of the slide. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's all good, you know, fine and dandy, so to say, and uh, definitely uh, large language models took it even further. But uh, first of all, I'm not covering that for the you know, lack of time. But secondly, uh, I think that um, large language models for program synthesis uh, will be useful only in the direct interaction with humans, or in the only in the use cases where. Uh, there is space for error, so to say. So the, the, the minor mistakes made by the synthesizer are okay, right? Because what we expect from the synthesizer is just a hint, right? Produce me, for produce for me a function that will uh, that will I you know uh, take two arrays and you know compose them in certain way. Uh, and given that natural language formulation, I can get a decent piece of, let's say, code in Python or some other programming language that is almost correct, or quite often will be correct, right? But occasionally will be not correct. And then this is my task as a developer to perhaps uh, make it, uh, make it uh, completely correct. Uh, yes, uh, so, but then uh, given the nature of the large language models, we'll probably still cope with those problems that there will be corner cases, edge cases, because this is, you know, in, in overall, these are still, you know, conditional probability distributions that are just based on the, you know, inputs and, and produce the outputs in quite rudimentary manner. They are just huge, right? They have, you know, huge numbers of parameters. And this particular slide, I'm citing a very interesting paper actually studying the limitations of uh, a specific class of um, you know, large language models, of DALI more specifically, uh, by actually, you know, Quite famous people in the field, you know, uh, Marcus and of course Aronson from former from MIT, currently I think in, uh, in Texas. And you know, the failure of large language models of, you know, uh, correctly responding to this kind of very simple questions uh, makes me not believe that in, in a no short perspective they will be able to provide us with robust program synthesis as well. Yeah? So that's one of my excuses why I'm not covering that. Uh, you know, in detail in this particular talk. Um, the other one, of course, being the limited, uh, the, the limitation of time. Um, so uh, I also suggested here that, you know, 
some of that functionality can be actually obtained using much more humble means. And with that, I can point you to a paper we wrote over like five years ago with my two PhD students, where we actually put, you know, conducted uh, uh, program synthesis from natural language specifications using much simple model. Yeah? Um, more specifically, we've been addressing uh, or using a benchmark which has been very recently then pro you know, pr proposed by some authors, uh, a, a, a benchmark of uh, programs uh, associated with uh, their specifications natural language. So each example in that database is a um, natural language statement that uh, specifies the task, the programming task being that, that, that is meant to be solved and the corresponding program solving that uh, particular problem, where the program is expressed in an uh, algo lisp, which is like a subset of lisp with a grammar specified here. So and they, the authors actually of this benchmark produce a quite substantial number of, of examples like this. And for that uh, particular task, we, we trained an uh, architecture uh, in the following way. So first we actually trained an uh, mm, tree to tree autoencoder in brief. Yeah? So uh, we uh, took the programs, actually, uh, rep these programs represented as abstract syntax trees, and we trained a model that would map them by node embedding and tree encoder, or more specifically, that was actually so called doubly recurrent neural network. Actually, like you can imagine an LSTM, long short term memory cell, embedded into another, actually nested in, in another LSTM cell. And uh, these uh, two modules were capable actually of folding those abstract syntax trees into latent representation of a fixed size. And then we had tree encoder with a very similar architecture, which was like unrolling, in a sense, this fixed dimensional latent representation into an abstract syntax tree. And we trained this autoencoder using, uh, you know, a specifically desired you know, loss function that was both penalizing the model for the loss on labels, but also for errors committed on the topology of, of those uh, trees, namely whenever the, uh, whenever the output tree was diverging from the input tree in terms of the shape, so to say. Yeah, and then once we had this trained autoencoder, which performed very well, uh, we actually trained a mapping from natural language uh, via word embedding. I think we used that famous word to vec, I think, ready to use embedding, you know, model. And sequence embedding using an ordinary LSTM. We, we, we learned a mapping from this natural language specification to that latent space. Yeah? So finally, actually, the whole model uh, is the pipeline from this natural language through word embedding, sequence embedding, latent space, and this tree decoder to the program. And this actually turned out to work pretty well. Here are some details about how, how actually those uh, tree uh, uh, WCARN neural network parses the trees. That's perhaps not that important. But most importantly, it worked pretty, pretty well. Uh, we were able to show that uh, with this particular architecture, we could actually outperform other approaches and synthesize programs uh, uh, with high accuracy. By accuracy, meaning the success rate, namely in, in terms of how many programs were correctly synthesized given, uh, given those natural language specifications. Um, and quite importantly, you know, this is a truly like generative system, right? It's being queried only once on the natural uh, language input and produces the output and that's it, right? There's no search, there's no explicit search. The uh, model produces, uh, um, produces the program in a single query. Uh, some examples. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you have in each row a natural language specification, specification of a task. In the right-hand side, you have the corresponding resulting program. Of course, some of them are trivial because the specification is quite trivial. You can see that, by the way, by dropping some syntactic elements from the natural language specification, you can still get actually correct program, which uh, in a sense shows a certain degree of robustness of the system. Uh, it actually, it doesn't have to be you know, specified in pure, you know, elegant English, right, to get the, uh, the correct solution. And as you may see also, uh, some of those specifications are were actually quite sophisticated. For instance, given an array of numbers, find the median of values in, the, in, in that array, 
after keeping only the first half of the of that array. So have you have to take the array, you have to slash it in two halves, and then you have to 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 sort it, you know, find the median and so on. Uh, so you can see that the the programs be being synthesized are actually quite quite sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, uh, that's one of example of a generative system. Uh, another example we I would like to point you to. Uh, again, they somehow marry this uh, uh, generative approach with uh, evolutionary search. Uh, as you may see, right, my, my connections to evolutionary optimization are quite strong. And in brief, uh, uh, the approach I, I'll be talking about here for a moment, uh, we call neuromimetic evolutionary optimization, where in brief, let me perhaps skip to the, to the diagram directly. What we did here, uh, we were actually trying to perform a mapping between the programs, the discrete combinatorial structure of programs, and uh, a regular, so to say, embedding a, a, a Cartesian space of a fixed dimensionality. Uh, to, to, to achieve that, we were actually training, again, an autoencoder, uh, where the encoder uh, and decoder, uh, if memory serves, were LSTMs, again, they were taking the programs, they were parsing them, or actually um, folding them into a fixed dimension uh, vector. And then uh, the decoder was unfolding that, getting a program again, uh, actually sh it should be P prime here, because of course in general this reconstructed program doesn't have to be identical as uh, to the original one. And the reconstruction loss is actually measuring the similarity between the reconstructed program and the original one. And after training, what we get here is actually a uh, mapping from the discrete space of programs to a continuous space of, of uh, you know, abstract space in which they are somehow embedded. And uh, additionally, we were actually training in parallel to that a surrogate model. Uh, in, in evolutionary computation, actually overall in optimization, a surrogate model is a model of your objective function that is typically designed to be or introduced to reduce the complexity of the original objective function. Because in many optimization problems, actually, running your objective functions may be computationally expensive. So uh, we also were training that model to introduce, to actually to, to predict the, the, the objective value of that particular solution based on that latent embedding only, right? So this surrogate loss was comparing the actual fitness or quality of that program in terms of the given task with the uh, quality predicted by the surrogate model. And that, and that, that is the key of the approach, I think. Uh, that enabled us actually to perform the search in this program space uh, in that latent continuous space. More specifically, after training this model, uh, whenever we get some candidate solution to be modified, we would take that candidate solution, we would uh, uh, map it through that encoder, that trained encoder, into that latent space, uh, for this simple illustration, I'm assuming the latent space is just two-dimensional, right? And in that two-dimensional latent space, we have the uh, isoquants, you know, the level sets of the objective function, yeah, because we train that surrogate model. Mm -hmm. And uh, the encoder actually maps this input program to a specific point in that embedding, yeah, because this is what, what, what we agreed to do here, right? But most importantly, because we also have this surrogate model, yeah, so the, we, we, uh, the surrogate model is a neural network that is like hanging over that, uh, that continuous space and predicts the fitness for or, or the objective function for each point in that space. Then we can take, take the gradient of uh, at the given point, or the, at that point of this solution, of that mapping, and use that gradient to actually move in that space. And that's exactly what we did. Namely, we used the gradient with the gradient of the surrogate function with respect to the variables in that latent space to move in that latent space in the hope, so to say, of arriving at a point which will have better value of the fitness function. And once we arrived at that point, yeah, that was just one step with a certain you know, parameter that you know, somehow determined the size of the step. Uh, we would be taking that uh, resulting point and we would use that, that decoder to actually map it back to the space of programs. Mm -hmm. So uh, I find it quite interesting because that's a, 
a rare example of an approach which actually combines, you know, the search in the combinatorial space uh, with the search in the in the latent space. And you know, uh, for brevity, I'm not even showing you the result. Yeah, but the, uh, you know, believe me, this actually worked, and outperformed several ba baselines. And in a sense, this illustrates the you know the holy grail. You know, I'm not saying it's solving the holy grail, right? But this is like pointing to the holy grail of program synthesis, in the sense of, you know, finding means of efficiently, you know, reordering the space of programs, yeah, in a way, or re-representing re the space of programs, in a way that allows us to search it in a, I would say, orderly fashion, right? Because normally it's very hard because you know, as I said changing even a tiny bit in your program will typically ruin in its behavior, which will completely modify its behavior. There's another approach that somehow builds on that, but again, given this limited time, let me just mention that this I, I find it's also quite interesting. And this approach we've been actually using uh, a state-of-the-art uh, covariant matrix adaptation evolutionary, synth uh, evolutionary strategy algorithm, which is actually very popular and very, uh, I would say, uh, respected, so to say, uh, evolutionary continu uh, co continuous optimization algorithm um, to actually perform search in that space. Yeah, and actually, I, th I think I have an animation here, yeah, where uh, in brief, this allows us actually to perform like mapping from the original space to the continuous space and then back to the uh, co combinatorial space, so once again, yeah, original program, initial solution, then perturbation in the latent space, back receiving the candidate solutions, and then uh, based on that actually generating uh, again the points in the space. So actually in this particular approach we were you know, like in parallel operating in those two spaces, in the space of uh, discrete programs represented by our popu working population, and in the space of the, uh, so to say, mapping on the latent space where those programs have been mapped. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, sorry, because of the limited time, I, I don't think I have more time to cover this. But, uh, okay, so this is essentially the final slide of this first part, part of my lecture, which captures this, uh, you know, this direction where we use program uh, machine learning to help program synthesis, to make program synthesis more efficient, and this somehow summarizes it. And uh, definitely there are, uh, there of course, again, caveat pending that uh, this is just a you know, selective uh, uh, fragment of what is available in the market, but I hope quite diverse, meaning that you know, it somehow points you to di into different directions. And now let me move on to the second part uh, where we're talking about how we can use program synthesis for machine learning. Uh, Sorry, yeah, um, I, I have a uh, sure. few questions about this. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> about scary. this second part, uh, because I was wondering if anyone actually used the uh, deep learning, uh, I would say generative models or something like that for for this particular problem. Because you mentioned only the large language models, but they are not like the only uh, the only way of uh, thinking about the generativeness in deep learning and we have for example some uh, diffusion models or normalizing flows operating directly on the uh, discrete structures mm -hmm. uh, compositional structures like graphs or something like that and I would uh, think it could be really effective also in this uh, in this direction but I do not know if anyone is working on this yeah, th very good question indeed. Uh, the of course, for instance, when we talk about generative, uh, you've mentioned some directions. The other obvious direction is, of course, GANs, right? And and of course, the all these uh, uh, models can be used. And indeed, there are examples of uh, uh, studies that go in that direction. I'm not aware of any of them that would be really like breathtaking or meaning like really uh, revolutionizing the field, right? Uh, but that's a good point, and actually, I like that you mentioned this compositionality and you know the fact that uh, we are talking about discrete structures here, and we clearly see that you know deep learning or the, the deep learning community is getting aware of those challenges and trying to actually to equip deep learning models with uh, you know some components or capabilities that en enable them to actually handle this uh, this kind of problems. Mm. So uh, I. 
I have a you know a longer list of uh, you know contributions uh, that somehow captures you know many program synthesis uh, approaches. No, again, no time for that. Um, I can perhaps then share it you know over email, but that the question is very apt. Yep. Okay, so maybe one more if I have a chance to. So what about the reinforcement learning approaches in the sense of generativeness? Because if you are like looking on many approaches given by DeepMind, even in the uh, theory proving in mathematics or mm -hmm. something like that, I suppose that problem are really really close to each other and I suppose that uh, you can actually use it for better I would say uh, exploration of the of the space of possibilities yeah that's a good point yeah indeed you know as a matter of fact we did uh, quite a lot in programs uh, sorry in with reinforcement learning but actually uh, for synthesizing game strategies with my team not for program synthesis for for the we, we did uh, you know early trials a few years ago and they were not particularly, uh, so to say, encouraging. You know, those recent developments are really, so to say, breathtaking and uh, very uh, impressive, so to say. But again, uh, um, frankly, myself, I'm interested uh, primarily in models which are more structured internally, meaning, and not necessarily so data hungry, uh, as reinforcement learning also happens to be. And uh, my personal take is to actually try to design machine learning architectures that can infer this kind of inf no, reasoning that is necessary for pr providing program synthesis using much more humble means, so to say, by providing certain structure up, up front. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's another one. Thank you. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up to, to the previous question, or maybe actually to what you just said, um, that you like to kind of build in the structure into the, the process of, or yeah, into the, the your methods of targeting program synthesis. But so th my Im interpretation of those large language models is that it seems that we can sort of amortize much larger pieces of reasoning than we previously thought we can, right? Like in, w in sort of one shot slash few shot. Mm -hmm. um, and you can also build the structure around that. I'm wondering if, yeah, if you have any thoughts on like the directions that people are taking to sort of, since we're now learning much bigger pieces, so to say, but there is clearly a structure around that that we need to incorporate as well. Like there need to be workflows yeah. on how to utilize those. Yeah, e excellent point. Indeed, that's, uh, I'm also impressed, <laughs> I must say. Although, I still w would like, you know, or, or, or I would prefer this to not become, a, in a sense, a side effect of an extremely large, complex model, which we, which is completely opaque, and we, as a matter of fact, don't know what is happening inside. And we can be, you know, we we still rely on this, you know, essentially conditional probability learning, right, or learning of con con conditional probability distributions. Um, uh, I wished and I strive for systems in which we can achieve similar effects uh, by essentially providing those, uh, you know, uh, elementary components up front uh, in, in a way that is more formal, so to say, or more explicit, right? Uh, I I not necessarily derived from huge volum volumes of data, yeah? but uh, you're absolutely right that this is, it might be the case that the approaches like the, the ones that you mentioned you know, one day become good enough for solving this kind of pr you know, questions, with this kind of problems in many use cases, right? Uh, uh, but they do not provide us actually, for instance, for with verify, uh, you know, with the interpretation or interpretability. Uh, they cannot be verified, right? They they do not have you know, do not you know, provide this kind of guarantees that quite many you know use cases require. I'm sorry, maybe this is uh, s this is not meant to sound argumentative, but uh, maybe it is a little bit. Um, but like in a way, the fact that those models output a, a program, a verifi well, verifiable program in a sense, in the first place, that is one of the best sort of uh, interpretability methods. We don't know how they arrive at the solution, mm -hmm. but that's in a way sort of secondary because we can verify the solution itself. Uh, unlike in many other settings, you know, where like, 
strictly speaking, like if we talk about regression, for example, yes, mm -hmm. and if, if we arrive at some value that cannot be formally verified, whether it's correct or not, then interpretability is very important. Like how mm -hmm. did we arrive at that predictive distribution? But in the case when the output of the model or the sample from the model is a verifiable problem, mm -hmm. Sorry, verifiable. We have a problem, and to get a program that can be verified whether it satisfies the definition, then yeah, I'm, all I want yep. to say is that that's pretty interpretable to me. Yeah, uh, as a as a final artifact, you know, I mean the outcome. It is right uh, what what the model is producing, but you still don't know how it arrived at that, right? And you cannot trace it. You cannot decompose that process into some, you know, uh, intermediate stages. Uh, there's also no reflection in those, mo those models, right? They cannot actually uh, explain, or exp no, I would say, of course, superficially, they seem to be able to explain why they arrived at some solution. But again, this is just due to those, you know, huge probability, you know, conditional probability distributions, in my understanding, at least, right? Uh, but you are right that, in, in a sense, you know, they actually fit very nicely this prioritization. Uh, you know, scheme because in, in indeed they find for you a plausible solution, right? That you can verify, and and that's a wonderful guidance. So, definitely, I'm not black and white. I, I can see the advantages, but uh, again, uh, my you know holy grail will be to have a system that can scale this up from so to say first principles that are like hard coded in the system, right? Perhaps even given as some theory at the very beginning, and having a machine learning system that can you know, reason about those components in a principled fashion, right? And not, not just superficially. Yeah? And th there will be a few things about that in the second part, which is, you know, uh, almost like, you know, I have probably like a few minutes for that. So let me just try to proceed. L let's know, say that uh, 15 more minutes is okay. Uh, uh, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> Should be, must be, yeah, so to say, yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, I will just, you know, provide with you like a essentially a high high level uh, overview here. Uh, now we would like to look at this, you know, meeting between machine learning and program synthesis in the other direction, right? Where we actually uh, the core, you know, observation here is that actually machine learning models are programs. Yeah? For instance, decision trees and decision rules are nested conditional statements, right? Neural networks are nested arithmetic expression. Bayesian nets are essentially probabilistic programs and so on and so forth, right? So in a sense, model fitting and training is similar to program synthesis. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we may think about actually using program synthesis as, in a sense, yet another paradigm of machine learning. Yeah? And uh, that's actually sort of happening, and that's my at least my impression. By the way, there are very nice parallels, so to say, uh, you probably have heard about so-called representation biases. Then those representation biases in machine learning can be likened to the DSLs in program synthesis, right? By designing a domain-specific language, you bias your synthesis system towards some class of outputs, right? And s similarly for the inductive bias. So, uh, and actually, in a sense, this slide is was meant actually to sort of address this kind of questions we just <laughs> I just received, right? So, and the, because the whole point here is that this provided DSL encapsulate the knowledge about the domain that is, you know, uh, fundamental, already known, right, or expressed in some formalism that is guaranteed to work, right, because we, we, we know a theory, for, so to say, for a given domain. And because of that, or given that, those programs can be transparent or untransparent, they can be inspected, verified, refactored, and so on. And they also broaden the space of representations we can use in such settings. Yeah? So in a sense, I'm arguing in a sense for, for a non-statistical machine learning, right? Uh, and I, I guess that program synthesis can be one avenue towards that, uh, that um, uh, goal because using such uh, non-statistical systems, we can cope, and per many would argue that is the only way actually to cope with the problems that statistical models will always face, like long tail distributions, exceptions, corner cases, border cases, and so on. Yeah. So, okay, I will skip this slide because that's, um, so let me just mention that there are, there's a few ways in which this can be done. And you know, in my past works, for instance, so a ex simple example is that you can simply use program synthesis for feature synthesis. You can actually design a DSL that 
expresses your features, actually calculates the features <coughs> in a way that is based or rooted somehow in a given domain, for instance, in image analysis. Yeah, I mentioned that, that before. So this is a, you know, an execution trace of a program or an image analysis program that started with the image and applies different operations from the OpenCV library to that image and produces also some features, and those features can be then fed into a machine learning classifier. That's a long, you know, old idea, you know, even when publishing this paper 15 years ago, that was already happening. Uh, just in, in two weeks, I'll be presenting a paper that we, you know, uh, a work that we did together with a company from the UK where we've been using uh, this kind of approach to synthesize features uh, for uh, you know, diagnostics in, um, in actual pulmonary diseases, more specifically COVID. Actually, we've been detecting COVID using a time series collected using electronic stethoscope. And for that purpose, we designed a domain-specific language that was actually processing time series and based on that, uh, you know, producing some diagnosis and we've been actually showing uh, pretty impressive results on multiple uh, data sets or actually collections uh, collected on John, uh, at John, John Hopkins University and over all over the world, actually in the Republic of Congo, for instance, and so on. Um, uh, you can also use this kind of philosophy, so to say, or domain-specific languages to you know, directly synthesize models. Uh, for instance, in that symbolic regression scenario that you've been exposed to, I've heard, you know, in some other lectures of this, of this school. Uh, for instance, what we did uh, uh, some time ago, we designed uh, uh, predict predictive models uh, for climatology, or more specifically, the models that predicted the a global temperature anomaly using other globally measured uh, indicators. And uh, thanks to that, we could arrive at pretty, you know, I would say interpretable expressions like this one. You know, I know it's quite convoluted, right? But for the experts, it's still better than probably than a deep neural network. And those models were actually capable of reproducing the dynamics of the uh, global temperature anomaly in a pretty uh, impressive manner. But frankly speaking, these I consider those efforts to be quite minor in a sense, or you know, just small contributions. If I'd like to point you to extremely interesting papers that actually go in that direction, then this is one that uh, definitely worth is worth mentioning, namely so, uh, the neurosymbolic concept learner by the excellent uh, uh, you know, team led by Joshua Tenenbaum of MIT. Where the task here was actually to learn the, uh, the actually to, to address the task of uh, visual query answering, the, where the task is actually to answer a natural language query associated with the uh, image. Uh, that's actually a widely considered uh, class of task in computer vision nowadays. How the authors solved this uh, particular problem was actually by designing a domain specific language that was actually based on the internals of the benchmark, because the benchmark actually was also automatically generated. And that language was featuring multiple uh, you know, types, like objects, uh, integers, booleans, uh, shapes of uh, objects and colors and so on. And uh, the, 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 the language itself featured multiple you know, uh, instructions with different signatures that you can recognize, and actually they are pretty, I would say, understandable or intuitive, like uh, intersection of object sets, right? Or, or ex extracting a feature or filtering, for instance, a set of objects using some characteristics like object color and so on. And most impressively, uh, this particular system was trained end to end. Namely, there was a, a semantic parsing module, which was actually, uh, which was generating a program Expressed in that DSL based on that, on that uh, natural language query, and that program would actually relate the, the terminals in that program, the symbols in that program would relate directly to the object, uh, you know, parsed so to say from the visual scene, using certain mechanisms, and this whole uh, you know uh, pipeline was mainly trained using Reinforce, you know, the one of the most well-known reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, but most in very interestingly, and I think I have this in the next slide here, the uh, bug background impre implementation of the DSL was actually differentiable, right? So actually the, the instructions of the DSL were implemented in a way that wasn't di differentiable. And thanks to that, 
when training this entire system end to end, the uh, loss function or the gradient flowing from the loss function here could actually flow through the programs to the embedding of individual objects from the scene. So sorry for you know just covering on the very high abstraction level, but this is you know uh, the I would say the gist of the idea, and I find it one of the most beautiful examples of using program synthesis for for this kind of tasks. And again, because you know um, I need to be quick, another wonderful study that I would like to definitely point you to is a dream coder, where uh, which is even more advanced <laughs> because in essence uh, here. Uh, we have a neural model that learns a distribution of DSL grammar productions conditioned on the tasks, but actually that model is being used in several phases, which are probably the best covered in this particular slide. So we have, a, uh, we have that model, which is actually being used just to solve the uh, tasks, so, and they, the authors call it the wake phase. So they, you know, the model is being asked on the task in a very similar way to actually what, this, what the deep coder was doing. And that model actually helps us to prioritize the search in the space of programs. But uh, most importantly, uh, the result of that is actually a large set of programs, many of them actually not co necessarily correct, right? But those programs can be then refactored. So there's an abstraction phase in which the, those large repositories of programs being created in the process are being you know, refactored in the search of common sub-expressions. So that uh, based on that, the system itself actually is capable of extracting new concepts, yeah, new sub-programs that seem to be universal. And that's one very interesting aspect of particular design. And the other one is that the authors also use this uh, phase they call dreaming, in which they use the, that, that model, actually the neural model, to generate uh, actually fantasies, or actually to, to generate programs that generate tasks. In the spirit that actually I was talking about in the very beginning, when I s told you that every program is actually a, 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 a data generator. So you can use that program to query it on some data and obtain that some output. And in this way, you obtain a new problem. And that problem enriches your, so to say, you know, database or your, your training set. And with this setup, or this is a brief you know, diagram that somehow shows the process of, uh, of uh, refactorization and determination of new, actually, concepts, like a concept of map, for instance, automatically refactored from the process. There was a question about lambda calculus, and that's actually the, the author's way here actually based the, the, the entire setup on lambda calculus. And yeah, and uh, with that, which is most, uh, most impressive here, is that the authors were able to actually use this particular setup or this uh, blueprint to solve very wide class of problems, or sent program synthesis programs. So not only just, you know, uh, list processing tasks or some you know, string processing tasks, but also actually drawing tasks or symbolic regression and so on and so forth. And that entire repertoire of tasks is actually covered by a single system, which is trained continuously in a way that uh, is capable to actually you know, determining, determining those new concepts which keep to occur over and over again, again in the process and are identified with that uh, refactorization uh, in that refactorization stage. Uh, so a few examples of the, for instance, the dreams, uh, so it's called dreams being generated by that system before learning and, and after learning, you can see that that sophistication of the patterns of the problems automatically generated by the system is in indeed increasing. And the you know, kind of task that it's being uh, capable of solving is also uh, increasing. So yeah. Um, a few closing remarks, if, if you permit, sorry for perhaps extending this a bit. Uh, so that, that is the essentially the map of the some of the approaches I was covering in this lecture. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, you know, again, uh, there are many other uh, tangential, so to say, aspects or directions that are worth studying. I'm mentioning some of them here. Uh, in particular, I haven't been touching upon completely the, you know, uh, other all types of so-called neural execution substrates where people were using essentially neural networks to explicitly e execute programs. Uh, there are also some other interesting applications of program synthesis, for instance, so-called super-optimization, 
which is nicely uh, covered with this famous textbook Hacker's Delight that m some of you may be uh, aware of. Uh, okay. Uh, if you'd like uh, you know, to be pointed to some recommended reading, then actually a very nice, uh, uh, t maybe not a textbook, but actually a work that somehow covers the, this, this border between program synthesis and machine learning is this one. Again, with a, with a uh, nice set of authors, including Almardo Solar de Zama, um, where I'm just you know, quoting here this uh, uh, one part of the tab table of, con of, uh, of content of this particular book, which actually explicitly mentions the motivating goals, generalization and sample efficiency, transfer and abstraction, interpretability, safety, procedural reasoning. So all those aspects I was arguing for a moment ago in this discussion, right, that, that this is the kind of virtues we can achieve if we treat program synthesis as an alternative uh, paradigm for machine learning. Uh, there are still some open questions. Uh, I will probably, for instance, uh, one of the, from my pers pr 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 private pr pr perspective, one of the uh, greatest challenges actually is this one, the sufficiency thing. Namely, we can, you know, uh, first of all, when, you, when working with program synthesis as a machine learning paradigm, you need to be sure that uh, the DSL you are designing is sufficient to solve the all the tasks in the class of tasks you are you know, dealing with. That's actually not that bad. That can be somehow proven. But learnability is the you know, quite important challenge, meaning that you know, the kind of uh, domain-specific languages that we humans like right, and are easy for us to you know, operate in are not necessarily the same type of D DSLs that probably are best suited for manipulation with machine learning systems. Yeah? So in a sense, it might be in a sense uh, the case that machine learning systems would like to use different DSLs, right? That would be more convenient for them. Yeah, yeah uh, so uh, the take home messages uh, from this talk, in my opinion, are that definitely we can use machine learning techniques to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of program synthesis. Uh, I think that program synthesis can be considered as a paradigm of machine learning. Uh, then program synthesis, m my opinion, may ultimately converge with machine learning in some sense, and I, m I think there's some preliminary evidence for that already, and differentiable programming and probabilistic programming are clearly some signs that this is sort of happening. And, you know, most of these particular uh, uh, models I've been discussing here were actually more or less neural, so we have actually very nice contribution to the neural symbolic systems. And overall, I would like to encourage you to somehow delve into this area because I find it really uh, fascinating. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and sorry for extending or stretching your time. Thank you. Thank you very much for this journey for program synthesis. So do we have any questions, the professor? Thank you, amazing talk. Uh, at the beginning, early on, you said that uh, we have a lot of commented and well-documented uh, codes from GitHub, for instance, or from documentation libraries. And I was quietly w uh, waiting for that. How can you take advantage of that? So there's a huge difference between code and code, right, in terms of like how for machine learning systems, how, how beneficial it can be to to actually learn from these kind of structures. And do you have any work going on on this? Uh, do you mean specifically comments? That yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. So actually, I, I probably am not the most competent person to talk about that because this is, again, more the domain of large language models. Because in indeed, they clearly are capable of parsing, so to say, both formal code and natural language. And they intertwine that very nicely. And it seems that, you know, that large language models can indeed, you know, uh, um, you know differentiate between one and another and find the co-occurrences between them and benefit from them. Um, actually, th there have been some works where, yeah, indeed, yeah, where people were uh, formally parsing you know, the comments uh, uh, from, uh, from the code, right? And you actually use it indeed as the input to the specification or the, to the synthesis problem. So simply, you know, in some programming languages, right, some comments can be structured, right? Uh, yeah, like uh, those dot strings, I think, right, in Python or somewhere where you, you know, put a quite strictly formatted, you know, comment under the, you know, s you know, head or, you know, the signature of your function. 
and then you can easily parse it out and you use this as the specification in a sense and use the code uh, the code of the procedure as the uh, the targets for the synthesis so this is this is how ha how that, that has been explicitly done in the past it seems to me that nowadays you know the tools like uh, github copilot or others are probably doing that in a more sophisticated manner which i'm not aware of frank thank you Jesus. thank you Do we have more questions? Okay, if not, then yeah, please cool. give a warm round of applause to Krzysztof Kawiec. Thank you.